Hello everyone and welcome to this tutorial on machine learning for optimal power flow. This is an area that has generated a lot of interest and excitement in the last couple of years and my goal in this tutorial is to try to share some of this excitement with you. Now we are going to talk about the electrical power system and as you know this is the largest machine built by humankind. In the United States alone every year the power system is consuming, generating, transmitting about $400 billion in electricity. And it works. It's a highly, highly reliable system. It's also a major success story for optimization. Almost every optimization technique has been used or is being used in planning and operating the power grid. It's also a major success story for machine learning and in particular for forecasting methods. But the times they are changing and I want to highlight some of these changes. One of them is on the generation mix. If you look at a system like MISO that you see on the screen, this is a system which is operating a slice of the grid from Canada to New Orleans. And currently MISO is about 90% of renewable sources of energy in its generation mix. But what MISO wants to do is to bring that share to about 30% in the next 10 years. There are also some fundamental changes on the load side, on the demand side, coming from electrification of transportation, electrical cars, for instance, also from solar roof panels, uh, which are changing the demand patterns of consumers. And this new reality is a reality in which you have increased stochasticity, both in front and behind the meter. And this is illustrated by this graph on, on the right side of these slides, which is also coming from MISO. And what this slides is showing you is that in this new reality, the forecasting errors have increased by an order of magnitude. But we have some new tools that we can actually use for addressing this particular challenge, in particular machine learning. Why is machine learning so interesting in this context? Because these physical networks that we are looking at, they are evolving very, very slowly. And operating a power grid consists essentially in solving the same problems all over again, every day, on very similar instances. So which is an ideal case for machine learning. And this is also the case for these market clearing algorithms that are basically being used every day, like the unit commitment, the look ahead commitment, the optimal power flows. But there are challenges, of course. So when you operate a power systems, you have to operate these systems under very strong physical and engineering constraints. So this raises unique challenges for machine learning. So what we have to do is what is called in machine learning, empirical risk minimization, but this time under these physical and engineering constraints. And that's what I want to talk about in this tutorial. So this is the outline of the tutorial. I'm going to start with some preliminaries and then move to two important topics, end-to-end -end optimization and learning to optimize. End-to-end -end optimization is the concept of replacing an optimization algorithm by a machine learning proxy. And that proxy approximates the behavior of the optimization algorithm. Learning to optimize, in contrast, is the idea of using machine learning algorithm to speed up the optimization algorithm itself. But let's just start with the preliminaries, and in particular, optimal power flow and deep learning. This is the optimal power flow expressed in complex notation. What you see is that we are minimizing the cost of generation, which is a quadratic function subject to the physical and engineering constraints. The physical constraints are the flow balance and the power definition, while the engineering constraints are the thermal limits, making sure that we don't exceed the capacity of the lines, as well as the limit on generations and voltages. Let me go into a little bit more detail because that's going to be important later on. So this is again the optimal power flow, but this time in the traditional hybrid polar and rectangular notation. And what you see here is that the input of the optimal power flow is the load, the real and the reactive load of every one of the buses of the system. Now the output is what you see below. This is the set point of your generators 
how much real power do they generate and what is the voltage magnitude, the set point for the voltage magnitude. The rest is obviously the physical and the engineering constraints. The engineering constraints are putting bonds on the voltage magnitudes, on the voltage phase angles differences, as well as on the real and reactive power generation. You also see the thermal limit here, a quadratic constraints, making sure that you don't exceed the capacity of every one of the transmission lines. The remaining constraints here are capturing the physics of the system, and it's important to distinguish the engineering and the physical constraints. The, the first set of physical constraints are the power definitions. And what you see here is the, react, the real and the reactive power, and you can see how nonlinear they are, right? So you see the voltage magnitudes here that are multiplying. They are multiplying also the sine and the cosine of the phase angle differences. The second set of physical constraints are the flow balance that you have at every one of the buses of the system. And once again, what this means is that what comes into a bus goes out from the bus. And this is also include obviously the generation and the consumption at that particular bus. And we'll come back to these constraints a lot inside this tutorial. Now, the second aspect that I want to review during these preliminaries is deep learning. And in particular, these neur deep neural networks that we will be using for approximating uh, the optimization algorithm. So what is a deep neural network? It's a network which is mapping some input to some output using a set of layers. And all the layers in this particular picture are the same. These are the traditional forward feeding networks. And every one of these layers is again transforming an input to an output. And its output is its, and the output of one layer is the input of the next layer. Now every one of the layer is transforming its input using an affine transformation, which is then run into what is called an activation function, which is a nonlinear function that I will review in a moment. So in the sense, if you are thinking about deep learning systems, you can think about a mapping from an input X that you see here and, and here to an output O. All right, and the structure of all the, of this neural network is very, very systematic. You see this affine transformation using these matrices of weights and this vector of biases, and then you see the activation function here. A very traditional activation function is the rectified linear unit, ReLU, which is defined as the max between zero and its input. So this is typically the network that we are going to use, except that there will be variation in the size of the various layers and how they connect to each other. Now, when you are trying to learn an optimization algorithm, the goal is going to be to train that particular network, and in particular, to learn the matrices of, of weights, the weight matrices, as well as the bias vector, such that you approximate the behavior of that optimization algorithm as best as possible. And to do that, one of the things that you will do is trying to minimize a loss function. And what you see on this slide is the core loss function that we will be typically minimizing. And what it tries to do is to minimize the distance between the ground truth, in our particular case, it's going to be the results of an optimization algorithm, and the prediction. And we're going to do that for every one of the instances in a training data set. All right, so we're going to get a lot of instance of this optimization problem, input, output, and we are going to try to learn that particular mapping. So let me move now to the end-to-end -end optimization part of the tutorial, and in particular, learning the OPF. And so what we are trying to do is to learn this mapping from the input, the load, both the real and the reactive load, into the generator set point, the real power and the voltage magnitudes of the generator set points that are the optimal solution to the OPF. That means that they are minimizing cost while satisfying the physical and engineering constraints. And there are a number of papers on this very topic. They share some features, but they have also some differences. And what I'm going to try to do in the next couple of slides is to give you the key features to be able to do this learning task effectively. And so what is the input? The input is a, is a database of instances, and every instance is a pair 
input output where an input are the the real and the reactive load and the output are the optimal set points of the generators. And what we want to do is use that database to learn a mapping, an approximate mapping from the load to the generator set point. And ideally this approximate mapping should satisfy the physical and engineering constraints and also minimize a loss function. And that loss function is trying to make the prediction as close as possible to the ground truth. So the prediction of the real power as of the generator has to be as close as possible to the optimal real power of the generators. And exactly the same thing for the voltage magnitude. We want to predict it voltage magnitudes to be as close as possible to the ground truth for the voltage magnitudes. And so what we can do in a first step is to build a vanilla deep learning network to approximate this OPF, to give us this approximate mapping. And so we start again from the load, the real and the reactive load, use a couple of layers to encode this, this load, and then use two sub-networks to predict independently the voltage magnitudes and the real power of the generators. Now, the vanilla network that you have seen is ignoring the physical constraints of the power systems. And what I want to show you now is how you can capture these physical constraints during the learning process. And so what we're going to do to do that is use concepts from optimization theory. The first thing we do is that instead of looking at this, this optimization problem and ignoring the physical constraints is is using a Lagrangian relaxation. We are going to take these physical constraints and dualize them inside the objective function. We're going to use Lagrangian multipliers, and then we are going to use this concept of violations of every one of the constraints. And I want to go into the detail of what this violation means. And let me take an example to do that. So what I want to do is compute the violation degree of these constraints, Ax is greater or equal to B. And to compute this violation degree, the first thing that I'm doing is computing what is called the satisfiability degree of that constraints. And this is going to be B minus AX. So if B minus AX is positive, the constraints is violated, and that's going to give me the violation degree. If it's satisfied, it's going to be a negative value or a zero, and that's going to be representing that the constraints is satisfied. And so to compute the violation degree of that constraint, I'm going to take the satisfiability degree and use it inside a max expression. I, I'm taking the maximum value between the satisfiability degree and zero. So if this is negative, you know, the violation degree is going to be zero. If it's positive, you know, that's going to be the violation degree of my constraints. I can do the same if this is an equality, except that now instead of taking a max, I'm taking the absolute value of the satisfiability degree. So if it's negative, strictly negative or strictly positive, you will have a violation degree for the equality. The only case where it's going to be with no violation is going to be when, you know, Ax is equal to B, the constraint is satisfied at equality. Now you can compute and define this violation degree for any constraints, you know, whether they are linear or non-linear. And that's what we use inside or Lagrangian relaxation. So now we can build what is called this constraints deep learning network, where we start from the load again, encode the load, but now we are predicting multiple values. We are not only predicting the voltage magnitude and the real power, we are also predicting the phase angles and the reactive power. Why? Because they give us the opportunity to compute the flow on every line. And once you have the, the flow on every one of the transmission lines, you can actually compute the physical, the violation of every one of the physical constraints. The violations of Ohm's law, the violation of the thermal limits, and the violations of the flow balance constraints for both, you know, real and reactive power. Now, how do we train this network? Now, this network has many more ways, and we're going to train them by combining both an empirical loss minimization and the minimizations of the violation. The empirical loss minimization, again, is trying to stay as close as possible to the ground truth, but for every one of the physical entities that we are predicting now. So the voltage magnitude, the phase angle, the real power, and the reactive power. 
The second component of our loss function is minimizing the violation. And what we are actually doing is minimizing equated combinations of the violation degrees on every one of those constraints. And the weight is given by these Lagrangian multipliers that I was describing before. Now, one of the questions that you may have is, how do we choose these Lagrangian multipliers? And once again, we are going to use a tool for optimization theory, which is called Lagrangian duality. Now, if you have a fixed set of multipliers, it's very easy to train on network. We can do what we typically do, right? We try to find the best parameter W such that we have, we minimize the loss function. But now, how do we update these multipliers? So how do we find the best multipliers? To find the best multipliers, we are going to use this concept of Lagrangian dual. We want to find the multipliers that are maximizing the value of that particular expression. All right, so let me show you how we do this in practice. Once we know the multiplier, we can train the network normally. But once this network is trained for those, you know, Lagrangian multiplier, we get a new set of weights for the network. And from those, we can compute the new violation of the constraints. And we can take a gradient step for updating the Lagrangian multipliers themselves. And we can update, you can iterate this process until we converge and have optimal weights and optimal Lagrangian multipliers for all particular constrained deep learning network. Now, the constraint deep learning approach that I've just presented is taking into account and minimizing the violations of the constraints. But at prediction time, it's not guaranteed to actually return a feasible solution. So if we have an application where our high quality approximation is not enough, we may actually try to consider how to restore feasibility. And what I'm going to show you is two techniques to do that in the next couple of slides. So the first approach is a projection method. What we are trying to do is to find a feasible point which is as close as possible to the predictions. So in other words, we are trying to find generator set points that are as, as close as possible to the prediction, but no are satisfying the physical and engineering constraints. So we find feasible generation set points that guarantees that the physical and engineering constraints are satisfied and they are as close as possible to the prediction that we have. The second method is a traditional power flow. And here the goal is to satisfy the visible, visible constraints of the system. Now we are not optimizing, we are just trying to find voltages and real and reactive power that satisfy the, visible, the, the physical constraints. And to do so, we fix a number of variables at every one of the buses. For the slack bus, we fix, we fix the, the, the phase angle to zero, and we fix the voltage magnitude to its prediction. At the PQ buses, we are fixing uh, the real and reactive power to zero. And for the PV buses, no, we are fixing the voltage magnitude and the active generations uh, to, the, to the particular prediction. No, there is no guarantee in our network that the predictions are actually satisfying the physical, the, the, the engineering constraints, the lower and upper bounds on generation and voltages. So this particular value that we are setting for the voltage magnitude and the active generations are adjusting the prediction to make sure that they are feasible by using sometimes the upper bound on the lower bound if there is a violation on that side of these bounds. So let me move now to the experimental results. And so what we're going to do is to use two networks for this set of experimental results, the French High Voltage Network and France Lyon, which is the French High Voltage uh, Network, plus a detailed description of the Lyon region, which is on the east part of France. And so you can see that these networks are of reasonable size, right? So the France Lyon has more than 3,500 buses, more than 45, oh, about 4,500 a transmission line, it has about 800 generators and more than 3,000 loads. And what we're going to do in the first step is compare three models. The vanilla network that I've shown you, the constrained deep learning network where all the Lagrangian multipliers are fixed to one, and then the constrained deep learning network where we use Lagrangian duality for training the network. So we adjust the multipliers uh, using this gradient method, this subgradient method. So the first thing that I want to show you is the model comparison. And there are 
there are essentially two key takeaways. The first one is that you should not use a Lagrangian, you know, a, a constrained deep learning method where all the Lagrangian multipliers are fixed to a particular value. That method is strongly dominated by the vanilla network as well as the constrained deep learning system with Lagrangian duality used for training. So from now on, when I'm, tell you, when I'm telling you that we are using constrained deep learning, we are using a constrained deep learning network which is trained using Lagrangian duality. Now the second key, key, key takeaway, which is really interesting, is that from an accuracy standpoint, both the vanilla network and the constrained deep learning give roughly similar results in accuracy. So you can see that both of them are highly accurate for predicting the generator set point. The difference between them is on active flows, where the constrained deep learning method has a very significant advantage. It produces orders of magnitude improvement in predicting the active flow. And that comes from modeling the violation of the constraint very explicitly. So from now on, the only results that I'm going to show you are the result of the constrained deep learning network because it's over, you know, you know, it's outperforming significantly uh, the vanilla network uh, when, when the, the constraint violations are taken into account. And so let's talk about the prediction errors now uh, for this constrained deep learning technique. And so what you see here is a, a, a number of plots for the voltage magnitude, the active generation and the active flows. And I'm going to focus more on the active generation because most of the results are similar in nature. So what you see here in the x-axis are the generators. And these generators are ordered from left to right in the amount of generations that uh, they produce. Now on the y-axis on this side, on the right side, you see the mean ground truth in terms of generations for every one of these generators. And you can see that we go up to you know, a gigawatt of generations there. And so this is the red curve that you see there. This is the generation, the average generation for every one of these generators. On the left hand side here, also on the vertical axis, you see the mean L1 errors in megawatts. And the key important thing to notice here is that this scale here is three to four orders of magnitude smaller than the scale on the right hand side. So the errors which are depicted in these blue, you know, blue lines and these blue areas are basically three to four orders of magnitude smaller than the actual generation. Very substantial, you know, very small errors in a sense compared to the, to the actual generation. And this is the case for essentially all the measures that you see there. Let me go a little bit more in the details of these prediction errors. So this is the actual numbers. And you can see, for instance, for active generations that in megawatt, this is a very, very small number. The average, the mean prediction error is very, very small. Uh, this is uh, the percentage of satisfied bond constraints. And you can see here that, you know, more than 99% of the time, the bond constraints are satisfied, the engineering constraints are satisfied by the predictions. You can also see the mean violations for the physical and engineering, for the physical constraints. And what you can see here is once again, some of these constraints may have some violation, but these violations are extremely small in terms of, the, of, of their magnitude. So, so let's look at what happens when you try to restore feasibility. And once again, we're going to talk about the projection method and, and the power flow. And the first table here is actually showing you the difference in objective, objective values when you restore feasibility compared to the AC optimal solution. And what you see here is that the loss in objective value, so the increase in cost, is 0.03% for the French high voltage network and 0 0.28% you know, in, in, the, in the French Lyon network. So very small increase in cost for using, uh, for using prediction, OPF prediction, instead of the, of, the, of the actual AC solver. Now the power flow does even better, but remember, it doesn't have to satisfy the engineering constraints and it will violate some of them. But most of the time, all these bond constraints, the engineering constraints are also satisfied by the power flow, as you can see in the table below. 
So both this, this projection method and the power flow can restore feasibility very effectively uh, once you have this prediction. So these are some experimental results here about the prediction time, the training time, and the time of the SEOPF. And one of the things that you can see here is that the prediction time is extremely small. So this is in terms of milliseconds now. Uh, compared to the OPF, they can be three or four or five orders of magnitude faster. Now, one of the things which is a little bit worrying is that the training time is increasing with the size of the network, which is not surprising since the input is increasing, the loads are increasing, the generators are increasing. And obviously the memory that this particular training is, you know, the network is taking is significant as well. And this is something that we'll address in subsequent part of this tutorial. And so let me take on the next challenge, which is about quality guarantees for the machine learning model in the context of power system. Now, this is a key obstacle for deployments. I've shown you experimental results that I believe are very compelling, but people may say, but yes, but how wrong can these prediction be? And what I want to tell you is that we can actually get some estimations of what these errors can be by formulating some really nice optimization problems. And this relies on a key assumption and a key observations that I will that I will go into now. So the assumption is that we have to assume that we know what can be the load patterns, right? So we are assuming that these load patterns can be described by some set of polyhedral constraints. So we have some idea of the load that we may encounter. And once we have done that, we can use this observation, this beautiful observation made in the paper below, that deep neural nets with radio activation can be modeled as mixed integer programs. And so once you have this assumption and this observation, you can start defining some beautiful optimization problems. And that was done in the paper listed below, which is, which is really nice in that respect. So what we have here is that we have an optimization model, which is finding out what is the maximum violation of the thermal limits. And so we define that as an optimization problem. This is defined on the DC model here. That's what they did in that particular paper. And it has three different kinds of constraints. So the first one are the constraints that are describing the load pattern. That's the assumption that I've shown you before. The second set of constraints, these three constraints there, are just formulating what the deep neural net is doing. And so we are basically using this formula to predict the active power. Then the last, two sets of, the last two sets of constraints are describing the violations of the thermal limit. They compute the active flow using PTDF matrices and vectors, and then they are computing the violations of the thermal limit for every one of the lines. And so what this model here is doing is finding the worst case violation for any of the possible load patterns. And so that gives you an estimation of what can, be, can go wrong. And you can take this idea and push it one more level, you know, one, you know, go one further step by also computing the worst case difference that you can have in the objectives between the predictions and the ground truth. And remember, this is something for which I have given you some, some compelling you know, experimental results, but here we are doing it formally, finding out what is the worst case difference that could happen using some of the assumptions that we've made. And once again, we have three sets of constraints here. The first one is the load pattern. The second one is again using the DNN for predicting the active power. And the last one is actually computing the ground truth. What is the cost of the ground truth for the particular load patterns that we are considering? So we consider a particular load pattern, compute the linear SDC model, and get the ground truth. And then the only thing that we need to do is to comparing the cost of the prediction and then the cost of the ground truth. And what the optimization model is trying to do is maximizing this difference to see how bad the predictions can be. Now, this is not an easy optimization program. It's a bi-level optimization, but in practice, you can do various kinds of techniques to approximate the upper bounds and the lower bounds to this particular problem. And so one of the interesting findings of this research has been that most of the time, this, this difference, this, this largest difference, and this largest violation occur at the boundaries of the, of the load, the feasible space for the load. And the recommendation is to actually uh, only make prediction you know, when you have enough data and not at this boundary. Now, we have seen how to 
how to learn the OPF. We have seen how to provide quality guarantees for the, the machine learning models. What I want to tackle now is the next challenge, which is how do we scale this? So one of the things that I told you when we were showing the experimental result for learning the OPF is that once you get above, let's say, 3000 buses, the, the, the CPU time and the memory consumptions of these models become very significant. Can we remedy this? That's what I would like to address now. And so the challenge is, is the following. Can we learn OPF solutions for very large scale networks like 5,000 buses, 10,000 buses? Can we do that? And once again, the key will be to use ID for optimization technology. And in particular, this concept of Lagrangian decomposition. So we want to look at the network and instead of learning the entire network on its own, we are going to decompose it in parts. You know, can I learn the left part, the, the left sub network? Can I learn the right sub network independently and then somewhat coordinate them on the linking lines? And so this is what we want to do. And so the, the challenge here is that you can really train the left network, the right sub network, because you have all the data, you have the training data to do that. But the problem is that at prediction time, you don't know the flow which is on the connect, you know, on the connected line, on the coupling lines. And so how do you remedy that? And so here's the key idea. So what you're gonna do is basically use a two-step approach. The first step is that you're gonna learn the coupling flows on these coupling lines. And once you have those, you can learn the regional subsystems exactly in the way that I've shown you before. These constrained deep learning networks with uh, a, a Lagrangian dual training step. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to learn the coupling flows and then we're going to learn the sort of regional subsystem. And that's how we're going to scale to very large system. And so the setting here is that I'm going to just allow 90 minutes of training time, 30 minutes for the first stage, 60 minutes for every one of the, sub, of the subsystem. And these are some of the test cases that we've been looking at. You know, again, you're going to see the French you know, high voltage system. You're going to see France Lyon, and you'll see some really interesting results on this. And then we start scaling up 4,000 buses, 6,000 buses, 9,000 buses. And one of the interesting thing is that you can actually decouple this network such that most of the subsystem now have about a thousand buses. And that's what we can learn very effectively. And the number of coupling lines that you see here is about, you know, a couple of hundred, up to 400. So we get subsystem here that are easy in a sense for us to predict because they have the size that we know we can do fast. Now look at some of the load of this particular system. This is 54 gigawatt. This is 312 gigawatt. These are very, very large systems. Okay, so let me show you the kind of results that we can get. The first thing that I want to show you is, is how we can predict the coupling lines. And this can be done really, really uh, with a high accuracy, right? So you see here the average errors in megawatt. You can see it, you know, in the pictures there, you can see the average and the 95 quantile. And what is important to note there is that both the active power and the voltage magnitude can be, can be, can be predicted on this coupling line very precisely. Now, let me show you the benefits of decomposition. And to do that, let's go back to this France Lyon system, for which I have already shown that the results were very good. But you can see that we can improve them using this idea of decomposition by an order of magnitude. And so this is a, you know, highlighting these results on one bus and one generator. And, and you know, the black lines was the result that I've shown you before. The blue line is the new results using the decomposition. And the red values there are the, are the ground truth. And one of the things that you can see immediately is that the, the decomposition method here is really approximate the ground truth very, very precisely and much better than the direct learning of that particular system. In fact, we are capturing here the nonlinear behavior of the voltage and the active generation much more precisely. We are following the ground truth much, much more precisely. Now, the bottom tables are giving you some overall results, which are, you know, much more, you know, quantitative. But what you see there again is that for France, you know, high voltage and France Lyon, you see an order of magnitude improvement in accuracy when you are 
using these decomposition methods. And this is quite remarkable, right? So we're learning this subsystem independently and we get overall an order of magnitude improvement in the accuracy for, for the set points of the generators. And obviously what is nice as well is that it scales to very large system and you keep, you know, the, the errors even lower than for the smaller system there. It's very, it's, um, it's, it's a very compelling result for these you know, decomposition techniques. So let me go into a little bit more detail here. You see for the French network now, which is the, the real French network, the real network. So what you can see is that the errors in voltage magnitude and active generations are really small compared to the nominal values, uh, the, the amount of generations that you have in this particular system. Uh, let me also show you the computing time, which are uh, quite remarkable, and also the, and also the feasibility uh, restoration process here. Once again, we can use the projection method or the power flow. And what you see here is once again, is that you can restore feasibility and have very, very small errors. Again, typically an order of magnitude improvement. So for France Lyon, for instance, the average error is like 0.002%, which is really, really small. And this has remained true for the largest network. And so the other things that is quite interesting is the fact that this power flow uh, for restoring feasibility give you also an order of magnitude advantage in computing time compared to the ACOPF. So you see here, you know, for France, it takes about three seconds to find, in average, to find, uh, to, to, to do the prediction and the feasibility restoration. The ACOPF takes about 35 seconds. So quite interesting results here in showing you the benefits of machine learning following, uh, followed by a steps of feasibility restoration. So now we know how to learn these large-scale OPF problems. And what I need to do now is to talk about one more missing piece, something that I have been placing under the rug for the first part of the tutorial. And I'm going to do that in the context of the Security Constraint Economic Dispatch of MISO. Now, the missing piece is the fact that the real-time OPF or the real-time economic dispatch doesn't take place in a vacuum. It's part of a very significant market clearing pipeline, starting from the day ahead unit commitment and then being refined in the look ahead commitment every 15 minutes. And so that has consequences that I'm going to talk about in a few minutes. But before that, I want to tell you about, you know, what is this security constraint economic dispatch that MISO is solving? So what they do in the economic dispatch is co-optimizing energy and reserve. They're trying to minimize the cost of both of them at the same time. Now, this is a DC model that capture line losses and also ramping constraints. It's also capture generator contingency. What happens if we lose the generator? And it has zonal requirements for the reserves. And so what is interesting to look at is the input of that economic dispatch. It's not only all the things that I've shown you for the OPF, it has also ramping constraints and reserve requirements, but there is also something that is really important. It has the commitment, commitments of the generators. Which generators can supply power, can generate power for different hours during the day. And this, these commitment decisions are increasing the input space tremendously. And that's one of the additional complications that you have in practice. Now, the output are slightly different as well. You have the active power of every one of the generators, but you also have the reserve dispatch of every one of the generator. But really, one of the fundamental issues is this, is, are these commitment decisions that we now need to capture. There is one more thing that I need to tell you about. And this is what this picture on the right is showing you. If you look at the picture on the right, you see the various wind generation that can happen during a particular day. You see also the solar radiation and the solar power that you can get from the solar farms. And what you see on the bottom picture is the net load, which is the load minus the renewable generation, because most of the time you're going to dispatch the entire renewable generation. And you can see that this particular net load has substantially different patterns during the day, very different values. And therefore, this is also raising some concerns on how you can actually learn an entire model that has these, these types of inputs and in addition, all the commitment decisions of the generators. So how are we going to address this very, very large input space? 
So what we're going to do is actually take into account the structure of the market, the fact that on the day ahead, you are making the the commitment decision for every hour in the next 24 hours. So you know for every one of the hours during the day, what are they gonna be the commitment decisions? And you're gonna also know roughly what's gonna be the load patterns, the wind generation, the solar generation. So what we do is that instead of training a single model, we are gonna train a model for every hours, every hour of the day. And we can do that because now we know how to actually train these models fast and we know how to make them scalable. So sometimes that will mean that we'll have to generate additional data, but most of the time we have enough data to actually do this prediction for these models given the commitment decisions of those particular hours and the load and the renewable generation patterns. And so one of the things that we will exploit when we are learning this model is the fact that most of the time, many of the generators are actually are the lower or upper bounds. That's what you see on these two pictures on the French system in, in January and August 2018. You can see that you know, from 20% 20, 20 of the generator are the min uh, generation bond limits, or in 60% of them are the maximum limit. So you are really deciding only about 20% of the generators. And it's actually even worse in August when the load is, is, uh, is, is different, where here what you have is about 80% of the generator at the maximum load. This is a heavy day on that particular day. So what we are going to do is exploit that information again, and we have a machine learning model that has two steps again. One classifier, finding out if the generators are the lower bound and the upper bound, or you know, somewhere in between. And then we have the deep learning model here for doing the regression stuff we have been doing so far, but only on the generators that are not at their particular limits. And so these are the results of, of the classifier. This is the classifier for the first step, for finding out which generators are the upper bound. And what you can see is that the deep neural net, again, has very high precision for this classification task, more than 90% in average in general. You can also see that the generator, compared to a naive classifier that used the previous operating point, what you can see is that it doesn't make bad mistakes. The fact that you're printing that something is at the min when it should be at the max. It reduces these kinds of mistakes. So not only it has a higher accuracy than naive models, it also has, it also limits the number of bad mistakes that you can do during the, the classification. And then you can see the power of the regression, the second step, and the, the combinations of these classification tasks and then the regression. And once again, there are two things that are important to see on this graph. It's first that this two-step method is better than just doing a single regression. And then the second thing which is interesting is to see how small these errors you are making when you are actually doing this prediction for every one of the hours in the day. So what I've shown you here is that you can actually have a methodology where you can solve these OPF or economic dispatch problems, learning problems, for every hour in the day very effectively, reducing the input space by focusing on a very specific time of the day and training this machine learning algorithm very fast. And so I want to finish this first part of the tutorial by talking about reinforcement learning, which I believe is a very promising direction for the future of, of machine learning in power system. And the motivation here is that OPF problems or economic dispatch problems are rarely solved in a core staff situation. We, always have, we almost always have an operating point. And once you think about about it this way, you can think about reinforcement learning, right? So you have a system space uh, which consists of the prior state, the operating points, the commitments, and then the predictions. And what you're trying to do is to adjust the generator set point to response to changes in load, in wind generation, solar generation, and so on. So you can view that as a mark of decision process or a set of Bandman equation. And the goal now is to approximate the Q value part of these Bandman equations using, for instance, a deep neural net. And that's one of the, that's some of the things that the paper on the right are doing. They are really approximating this Q value part using a deep neural net. 
And so the, it's a very promising avenue. It doesn't have the same level of experimental evaluation as the supervised learning techniques that I've shown you before, but many of the techniques that you have seen would apply to this context as well. And reinforcement learning may have some of the benefits for capturing long-term behavior, as well as the new technology that will come into the, into the grid, like battery technology and so on and so forth. So I just wanted to mention that to finish this first part of the tutorial. Let me now move to the second part of this tutorial, which is learning to optimize. And here, the, the, what we are trying to do is very different. So we are, we are using machine learning to speed up an existing algorithm. So it's different from the end-to-end -end learning approach that you have seen so far, in that we are not trying to learn the mapping directly. What we are trying to do is to try to learn some pieces of an algorithm, replace some pieces of, a, of an algorithm by a machine learning model, or reducing the problem dimensions, or identifying important substructure of a particular of a particular model such that we can speed up an existing algorithm. And I'm going to start illustrating this to you with a very elegant method uh, that was proposed in the paper that you see below, a learning boosted quasi-Newton method for ACOPF. And the key idea there is to look at the quasi-Newton method, and in particular the Newton step, which is defined in terms of the Jacobian of the KKT conditions and the current evaluations of these KKT conditions. And the machine learn the, the key idea behind this, this, this learning boosted method is to replace this costly evaluation, this costly right hand side by a machine learning model. For instance, a deep learning net that has been learned from historical data. And the hope is that this is going to be sufficiently precise to approximate well this right hand side, but at the same time, it's going to give us very significant benefits in computational efficiency. So once again, you take a piece of an existing algorithm and replace it by a machine learning model. And so these are some of the preliminary results that that paper reported. They are promising. They are not yet where they're supposed to be compared to some of the supervised learning methods that we have seen, but they, they are very encouraging. So you see first that the, the speed up here are very substantial, speed up by a factor of 36, 22. Uh, so that's, that's particularly substantial compared to the original method. Now the cost, the difference in objective cost is reasonable. It's not the same kind of quality of what we have seen before, but it's on the way to, 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 being, you know, to being reasonable. Uh, there are some issues with the constraint violation, but once again, this could be improved by improving the neural net. You can see that the violations of the constraints is actually increasing as the, networks, as the network increases in size. But once again, what I want to repeat is that this is you know, some preliminary results which are encouraging on this type of learning to optimize method. So let me now move to learning to optimize the security constraint OPF. And I'm going to give you some of the motivations behind what this model corresponds to. I'm going to go into a lot of details here so that you understand the problem, so that you can understand why machine learning is extremely valuable in this particular context. So what we are trying to do is to design an OPF solution which is going to be resilient to the loss of a generator. And so the key point is that you are at a particular operating point. Now you lose a generator, which puts the system in a, in a dangerous state. And what you want to do is that in the past contingency state, you restore feasibility. So that's what we want to do. Now, so what we are going to assume here is that we are going to deal only with n minus 1 contingencies for the generators. So that means the loss of a single generator. Right? So the modeling framework is what I just told you about. Right? So you have a precondition pre-contingency state, and then we have a post-contingency -conting state. Now, in the pre-contingency state, you decide the dispatch of the generators. What is the level of active power for every one of them? And after the contingency, you want to be able to restore feasibility. So you want to essentially choose the pre-contingency dispatch such that you can restore uh, feasibility after the contingency. So we have two types of variables, obviously, the pre-contingency variables, that's typically the variables that you've seen before. So what is the active power of every one of the generators? So in, in particular, at every bus I, where there is a generator. And then the post-contingency is going to be the post-contingency generation for every one of these generators, assuming a particular scenario, a contingency S, which is the loss of generator S in a particular case. Right? So that's what we need to do. 
Now, so this is a model that we could actually formulate, right? So once again, you have this, the loads as input, and now you are minimizing cost of the pre-contingency state. So these are all feasibility constraints that we traditionally have. But in addition to that, now, for every one of the contingencies, every generators that we can lose, we also want to be able to restore feasibility. So, uh, so the post-contingency state of the generators has to be a a feasible solution to uh, the power flow and obviously in those particular cases the generator S which is under contingency cannot generate you know real and active power. That can be the model that we would like to solve. Now this model, this model is complicated enough but it's too simple in practice. Why? Because in practice the power systems involve control systems. They are closed loop systems that actually handle these contingencies uh, to, to, to react to one of the, they react to a particular contingencies. So we don't have full, full flexibility on, this, on the dispatch. That's what I'm telling you. The control systems are gonna react, they are gonna do certain things. And we need to capture that without really modeling the entire dynamics of the power system. So the issue is how can we model this? How can we capture uh, this particular these particular uh, control systems in a way that we can still get steady state optimization. And the key concept here is this concept of quasi steady states. And I'm gonna illustrate this uh, in, 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 in showing you how our system is reacting to a contingency. So once again, consider for instance, the French system, we are losing these generators. You know, the frequency is going down and the first step is gonna be you know, stabilizing that frequency and getting a steady state here or a quasi steady state at a lower frequency. That's the primary response. The generators, you know, across Europe are gonna to react to this. And then what we want to do is now move to the secondary control and restore the frequency, but having only the generator in France responding to this particular case. And then afterwards, there is the tertiary control where we restore the reserve and you know, we make sure that we can respond to another contingency. So what I'm gonna talk about primarily is the primary and secondary responses. And they are very similar in the way you deal with the, with, with the, with the control systems of, or the AGC if you want. All right, so this is all this is how these systems are reacting. So the generation in the post contingency state is going to be a combination of the pre contingency state plus a delta, a, a, you know, a response of the generator. So the, the post contingency response, uh, active you know, generation in this particular case, is going to be the pre contingency plus a particular response. And that response is to satisfy, obviously, the reserve limit of that particular generator. You cannot generate too much power at that particular generator. There is a, a maximum limit that you can do. The other things that you need to do is that all the generators are going to respond based on, you know, participation factor, this Fi. And, you know, for a particular generator I, there is a, there is a, 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 a a participation factor that tells you how this generator is going to react. And so what we have to choose is this global signal NS, which is between zero and one, which tell you how much every one of the generator is going to participate. Is it 30% more generation? Is it 10% more? Is it 2% more generation? And so the proportional response of every one of the generator is going to be the minimum of this particular proportional response and the maximum reserve that they have. All right, so you have to say, hey, you know, proportionally, this is what I need to contribute, but obviously I have a limit and I'll take the minimum of these two. And that's my proportional response. Now, one important point here is that this signal NS is a global signal. Every one of the generator is receiving it and they react proportionally to that particular signal. And obviously different generators can have different, you know, uh, a participation factor. So, uh, so, and this goes for both primary and, and secondary responses. All right, so uh, let's, look at the, let's look at this particular point here, these, these limits that you see here. They are very important because this signal here is not something that you can compute easily, right? So because, you know, you can say, hey, I need this, all these generators to participate like 10%, but then you see that some of them are hitting the limit, so you have to increase the participation of other ones. So you need this participation factor in a sense to capture the fact that you're gonna bump for some generator to the maximum limit. 
All right. So this is um, this is what you need to be able to do. And so the optimization model now becomes this very nice, very elegant, you know, optimization problem, which has the sub models that I've shown you before, you know, the, the pre-contingency constraint, the post-contingency constraints. But now we have also captured the, the proportional response of every one of the generators, as well as the maximum response that they can provide. And once again, the output is the same, is the pre-contingency uh, set points for every one of the generators. That's what we want to do. Now, this is not an easy model to solve, obviously. So what do we do in practice? In practice, you solve these problems using what is called a column and constraint generation. You don't start with any contingency. You start from the nominal case, the pre-contingency case, case, and then you optimize the model. And now you look at which are the infeasible contingencies, the ones which are really difficult to handle. And so you add, you isolate them, and then you add them in the set of contingencies, and now your master problem becomes this, this, this nominal case plus the contingencies, and you optimize over that. So in a sense, what I'm telling you is that we're not solving the model that I've shown you globally. We are only adding the contingencies that we need to add, adding the variables and adding the constraints on need, on the need basis, as we identify the important contingencies. Now, how do we do that? Typically, what we do is that we have a very efficient algorithm to finding out what are the you know what is the response of every one of uh, of the contingencies. And typically, you can do that by finding this global signal using a binary search, and then you find the most violated contingencies. And that contingencies that contingency you add the variables and the constraint, the disjunctive constraint that are coming from this min and max inside the master problem. And that's how you solve the problem. Now you have a problem which is more complicated. You re-optimize the master problem and you identify potentially new important contingencies. So the key point here is that there is a very fast algorithm for finding these contingencies, which one are violated, and you only add the one that are needed uh, as you go along. All right. Now, what is what is a, a learning to optimize method in this particular case? Now, the, the, the time consuming aspect here is primarily the optimization of the master problem. And so what we're going to do, and this is kind of a security constraint, so PF, right? So we have a certain number of contingencies and we have seen that we can learn these problems, you know, in the first part of this tutorial. And so what we're going to do is take this piece and replace it with a deep neural net using Lagrangian duality and, you know, the Lagrangian relaxation. And now what we do at every one of the steps here is that we are basically solving this particular problem, this particular machine learning problem on the nominal case and the contingencies. And then we use the traditional method for identifying which contingencies are violated and adding new contingencies inside, inside, uh, inside uh, the master problem, which is no solve using this deep learning system. Now, obviously, you know, at subsequent iteration, we don't have exactly the same problem. We are adding new constraints. And therefore, what you have to do here is to use the previous starting point. You won't start, in a sense, the machine learning system. You are learning a new system with new contingencies, but you can use the previous weights uh, for the matrices of the DNN when you are training the next, uh, next neural net. So, so you combine two ideas here, the fact that you are using learning to optimize, replacing uh, the optimization of the master problem by a machine learning problem, but you are also adding this idea of reusing the previous way that you have learned in the prior iteration by, uh, for, for you know, learning, the next, uh, learning the next DNN that you need because you added some new contingencies. No, the results are really interesting. So one of the things that I'm showing you here is how you can nicely capture the nonlinear behavior of the generator as the load increases. When you have all these instances, these instances are, are differing in the way the load is increasing. And you can see a very nice, the, 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 the nonlinear behavior of these generators that are nicely captured by the prediction. So it's, uh, it's actually pretty interesting the way you can approximate the real nonlinear behavior of these generators as the loads are increasing. Uh, these are some of the results on the mean absolute errors of the prediction. And once again, you can see that they are very small in terms of the nominal values, uh, the, the, the generation range of the generators and the overall generation inside the system. You can see that, you know, as the generator increases, these errors are, are smaller and smaller. Uh, and so which is exactly what we need to happen inside the system. 
Uh, you can also restore feasibility at the end using a projection method. So this is a projection method that we have seen before. We want to find the closest feasible point uh, to, the, to, to, the, to the prediction. And, and once again, what you can measure is the cost increase by using the machine learning algorithm and then the feasibility restoration compared to the ground truth by solving the exact optimization. And you can see that in general here, the cost increase is extremely small. It's a very, very small increase in, um, in, in objective function, like 0.07%. So this is very minimal increase. Uh, in terms of the objective difference between the machine, the learning to optimize system and uh, the real optimization algorithm, the exact optimization algorithm. What is particularly interesting is the speed up in, 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 uh, in computing time. So what you see here, this is the algorithm there, the, the, the learning to optimize algorithm. This is the optimization algorithm and you see essentially two orders of magnitude improvement in efficiency. Another thing which is quite remarkable is that this is a heuristic algorithm, which basically choose the initial set point such that you don't have this disjunction. It's a conservative approximation. And this is a heuristic algorithm, and even that heuristic algorithm is all performed by the machine learning system, by the learning to optimize system in a sense. So once again, you know, very, very high accuracy and at the same time, two, or, two orders of magnitude improvement in efficiency. That's what you can do when you do these learning to optimize methods and use, for instance, deep learning system to replace one component of a complex algorithm. So let me, um, let me talk also a little bit about all other learning to optimize approaches because there are many of them. And it goes beyond this tutorial to you know, give you a, a detailed presentation to every one of them. But I just want to mention a lot of interesting words which is happening uh, right now. So about learning you know, ADMM. So the, this is a very interesting issue and learning once again can bring you substantial benefits. Learning warm start, you know, how do you actually start AC optimal power flow uh, from, you know, good starting points. So this is also where you can learn, use this learning to optimize techniques. Another thing which is really interesting, it's, it's a little bit about the lines that we have seen in the clustering, the classification problems that I've shown you before, is learning, for instance, optimal active constraint set. Which constraints do I need to add at the beginning to speed up the computation? Can I actually find out at the beginning which constraints are going to be needed so that I can put them directly, for instance, in a master problem? And so you have a sequence of paper here that are also very interesting in how they are actually approaching that particular problem. So a lot Lot of possibility here in learning to optimize. I've just scratched the surface of the kind of techniques that you can use to improve existing algorithm. So uh, this is time to conclude. Now I want to summarize a little bit uh, of what we have been doing in this tutorial. So we have been using machine learning for the OPF problems, a variety of different uh, uh, types of OPF. And what I've shown you is, is essentially two different types of approach. One approach is up the approximating the, optia, the OPF very quickly and with very high accuracy and scalable methods to do that. And I've also shown you that uh, we can actually also speed up uh, the optimal power flow by replacing some of the components. So there are these two approaches uh, that, that we have presented in this tutorial. Now, end-to-end -end optimization is the first one. And a couple of things that I told you about is how you get to something which can be used in practice. First, you may have to make this prediction accurate and you can use like Lagrangian duality to do that. You have this constrained deep learning network that take into account the constraints using a Lagrangian duality approach. You can make them scalable by using spatial decomposition, you know, inspired by Lagrangian decomposition and, and predicting both the, co the, the, the coupling flows and then the subnetworks independently. You can also make them very practical in a market clearing pipeline by doing this time decomposition following the results of the unit commitment, the day height unit commitment. And interestingly also, uh, I've shown you techniques for actually validating these results using MIP solvers or other technologies as well. And so this provides you know, a comprehensive approach for approximate uh, these optimal power flow problems quickly uh, and with high accuracy and in a scalable fashion. 
I also talk about learning to optimize, where you take an existing algorithm and replace some of the optimization components or other components by optimization proxies. I'll talk about learning boosted quasi-Newton methods. I'll talk about learning security OPF with proportional response, showing you how you can replace some component by machine learning models. So this gives you a kind of a, of a portfolio of techniques that you can use uh, from machine learning to improve optimal power flow. Similar techniques are being investigated for other types of, of power system optimizations, uh, but again, that's you know, outside the scope of the tutorial. So I, you know, I hope that I gave you enough material to be interested or excited about this particular topic, and obviously I'll be very happy uh, to uh, answer any questions that you may have. Thank you very much.